But there's only going to be two different kinds of things we'll talk about here. And instead of starting with the machines, like we did for finite state machines, we'll start with the grammars. Because I talked about right and left linear grammars at the end of this unit. So we're going to shift on and talk about grammars at the beginning of this unit. And that's kind of the fundamental beginning. And then we'll talk about the machines that are equivalent to that. Before I do that, I want to finish the big picture. This set of languages is not the big picture. There's an even bigger picture on the outside, the Turing machine languages. And inside this picture, we're going to refine it once during this next week into two parts. The context-free languages generated by the grammars I'm going to describe today are this whole level, but it's divided into two parts, one on the outside, one on the inside, in the hierarchy. In the inside are the machines that correspond to context-free languages that are deterministic they're called deterministic push-down machines, PDM, push-down machines. And on the outside are non-deterministic push-down machines. Context-free languages are equivalent to non-deterministic push-down machines. Deterministic push-down machines have less power than non-deterministic push-down machines, and they represent a subset of the context-free languages a very special subset whose grammars are very difficult to describe easily, but are very important. I'll tell you what they're called. They're called LRK grammars. Deterministic pushdown machines are equivalent to LRK grammars. Non-deterministic pushdown machines are equivalent to context-free grammars. LRK grammars are a subset of the context-free grammars. It is not very easy for me to describe what LRK grammars are, except as that they're equivalent to deterministic machines right now. I'm hoping that Dimitri will be able to spend a two or three days giving you some more details about LRK grammars, because they are the grammars that most compilers are built from. If you want to describe a programming language, you almost always describe it with an LRK grammar. The implication is that if you have an LRK grammar, then a compiler is easy to build around it. If you have just a general context-free grammar, a compiler is, could be very difficult to build around it. You need determinism to build your compiler. And unlike this case, where non-determinism and determinism were really the same in disguise, here they're really quite different. All right, that's the big picture of where we're heading today. And today, in particular, we're going to talk about the grammar aspects of things. Okay, questions so far? Donna. What you just said, that the non-determinism and the determinism is quite different. Yes. Does that mean that it's not that all deterministic machines are also non-deterministic machines in the CFL? Or are they contained in them? They are contained in them. Yes, they are contained in them. Okay. Except that this really has more. Okay. In other words, here, everything, everything is really the same. Non-deterministic finite state machines equal deterministic finite state machines. Okay. Certainly, deterministic finite state machines are a subset of non-deterministic finite state machines. But in this case, they are a proper subset. There really are things out here that are not in here. And I, I can give you an example in a second, or even now if you care, but you can wait and find out. Whatever you like. Other questions? All right, so we're going to talk about grammars, terminology about grammars, and uh, how they relate to this new level. So I will now tell you what a context-free grammar is. A context-free grammar is any grammar at all, as long as the left side of every production has a single non-terminal symbol. Okay? As long as the left side of every production has just a big capital letter, no double capital letters. I'll do an example later today about grammars that are not context-free, that have longer symbols on the left side. And I'll show you how much more powerful they are. They're really powerful. Context-free grammars say you can substitute a single capital letter for something. And the thing on the right is completely unrestricted. Remember linear grammars, left linear grammars? They are more restricted than context-free grammars. They are context-free because they have a single terminal, non-terminal on the left. But on the right, they're restricted to having productions of the form terminal, non-terminal. That's if they're left linear. If they're right linear, they're restricted to be of the form non-terminal, terminal. But they can't be anything else. Here, we can have anything on the right. Now, grammars are very powerful things and very hard 
to predict exactly what it is they're doing. And there's a lot of techniques to designing grammars and a lot of techniques to understanding them, a lot of techniques to making the connection between grammars and what's called parsing, which is the second important stage of a compiler. And we're going to talk about all those things today. So here's our first grammar. This funny vertical line just saves me space. Instead of me saying S produces 0, S1, and then writing again S produces the empty string, I just make a vertical line to show that it can produce one or the other. Okay, it's just a shorthand, and you'll see those vertical lines a lot. So here's a grammar. It has two productions. What do you think? Um, what kind of strings does it generate? Is the S recursive? Is that the idea? So let's go through it. Here is the first production. S goes to 0, S1. And now if you produce it again, it's recursive. So S can be substituted with 0, S1 again. So you get 0, 0, S1, 1. Everybody see what I did? Here I substituted S for 0, S1. And here I took that S and I substituted 0, S1 in place of it. So I got 0, 0, S1, 1. I could stop at any point and make S go to the empty string. And then I'd get a full derivation of a string. I could do it now. And I get 0, 0, 1, 1. So this grammar generates 0, 0, 1, 1. What else does it generate? 0, 0, n, 1, n. Right. It generates any equal string of zeros followed by the same number of ones. String of zeros followed by the same number of ones, including the empty string. So this is the language 0 to the n, 1 to the n, n greater than or equal to 0. That was the main language we started with that isn't a finite state machine. So right off the bat, if you have a context-free grammar that's unrestricted on the right, which every context-free grammar can be, you immediately get a set over here, which is definitely not in here. So that shows that we've moved out of our universe into the next universe. Questions about that? Here's another grammar. These first couple grammars are going to have only the start symbol. I'm not even going to introduce other non-terminal symbols. I'll introduce other non-terminal symbols later. Here's another one. And this should look familiar to you if you think about it for a couple of minutes. What kind of strings does this grammar represent? Think about it for a couple of minutes. EJ's laughing. What's so funny? <laughs> you know the answer? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, OK. What's the answer? Good. It's the balanced parentheses or proper parentheses strings where the zero is an open parenthesis and the one is a closed parenthesis. And how do you know that? Well, I'm not sure how EJ knows it, except that he did. But if you look here, there's two rules. It says if you want something to be generated by S, how do you do it? Well, either it's just the empty string, or if you have something already generated by S, you can put a zero on the left and a one on the right. That's the rule about putting an open and closed paren around something that's already balanced. What's the other rule about making balanced parentheses? If you have one set of balanced parentheses and another set of balanced parentheses, you can concatenate them together. That's all the rules, and it's if and only if. So here's rule number one. Here's rule number two. So this should, according to that recursive thinking, generate all strings of balanced zeros and ones where the zero should be thought of as an open paren and the one as a closed paren. I want to look at this in some detail now that we have this example down. So are there questions about this? Everybody got it? All right. Let's kill our picture here. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. I want to pretend that you guys are a compiler today. I just gave you the description of a language. It accepts certain strings. It, re it, it generates certain strings. Not as difficult as a programming language, but it does generate certain semantic strings, balanced parentheses. And here is a particular string. Now, you know what it does, and you're humans, and you're smart. You should be able to look at this string and tell me, yes or no, does this grammar generate this string or not? What's the answer? 
Yes. Yeah? How'd you figure it out? How'd you do it, Doug? Um, I just matched up the ones with zeros, basically. <coughs> which one was which zero? Well, I went until the first first one, and I matched it with the first preceding zero that had not been matched. All right, so, so Doug's strategy is, is to go left to right, find the first one he sees, and match it with the zero that precedes it. Provided that hasn't already been used. Okay. So you do that and you match these. Yeah. And now what do you do? Go to the next uh, one. Zero, one. Okay, and you match them. Match and what about now you get another one? What do you match to? with the zero, the third zero. Okay, so if you were doing this as a computer, you might have had these zeros stacked up, so to speak, somewhere. And when you get to the next one, you would back up and look at them. Right? There's kind of this natural stack thing where you're holding the zeros. And when you get to a one, you match the, the one with the zero that you saw most recently. A simpler way would just be to count, make sure they're equal number, and then make sure it ends with a one, since it starts with this. Uh, one. Yeah, one. maybe. You have to have more zeros than ones. You have to have more zeros and ones along the whole way. Oh, that's true. That would be yeah. equivalent. Yeah. In fact, that's what I asked you to prove in the homework, the last homework. There was a reason I put that completely arbitrary problem on the homework. It was a review for discrete math, but also I want you to think about grammars and parsing already. But let's go with your, this strategy is fine. It's perfectly reasonable. You want to match these two now? Yeah. And then we continue, so these two match. And then this one matches with this one. And now 0, 0, 1, so these two match. And these two match. We're at the empty string, and we're OK. So we could write some kind of program based on this strategy that would read this string and tell us yes or no. Right? How does this program that you just wrote connect to actually coming up with a sequence of derivations that end up with a string? Or does it connect to it? In other words, I want to start from S and end up with this. What should, find, what, what should my first production be? You got three choices. Let me give you the one choice that's pretty bad. I'll rule this one out for you. <laughs> Don't use the empty string. You got two choices. Which one do you use? Michael, did you say? Why do you use SS? Because oh, I can see there's a Right, Michael's smart, Michael's got eyes, and Michael sees that there's this spot here where this on its own can be generated as a balanced set of parentheses. So this could have an S that generates it. And this is also what's on its own as a balanced set of parentheses. This would have an S that generates it. And moreover, the whole thing, if you take away the 0 and 1 on the ends and then look at what's in the middle, that is not a balanced set of parentheses. So if you use this and you started with this, you would never get this string. You would continue on for a long time, trying lots of possibilities, and you would never succeed. If you started with 0s1, you would never succeed because s would never be able to generate the string starting from here and ending here. So is there a unique, what would you call this, production that will produce that string? Or are there That's a good question, and we'll make that question more specific in a minute, and we'll answer it. It's a very important question. Yeah, Gary. There's not a unique way of parenthesizing. There are alternate ways you could have, you could have done this. Oh, uh, I don't know. Is that true? I think so. How else could we have done it? I'm not sure there is another way. I mean, okay. we went through Doug's algorithm. We, we did exactly what he said, and there was no choice along the way. So I don't think there's any other way to put these, put, to pair up these zeros and ones. I think that's the only way. There may be another way of generating this, but, but we certainly can't start with 0s1. That won't work. And Michael's idea to start with ss, that does work. So we'll start with ss. And now what should our next step be? Think of this s as generating this left part, and think of this s as generating the right part. Each one of these is a balanced parent on its own, which has a 0 and 1 on the end of it. Notice this one has this long span, and this one has this long span. And in the inside is another set of balanced parentheses. So Chris is right. For both of these, we can substitute 0s1. And in fact, we should. We have to. If we do ss for both of these, we're just not going to make it. This is not made up of two concatenated sets of balanced parentheses. It's made up of 
one set surrounded by a zero and a one. So there's only been one correct choice so far every stage of the way. Everyone agree? Now, so we're going to substitute. Which one should we do first, the left or the right? All right. And now, now I guess we'll do the left. Or should we do the right again? All right, so you have discovered what's called a rightmost derivation. When you do this, you always have a choice of which one to substitute for next. So you just randomly go substitute? Well, you can, but very often, in order to keep things organized, we either fix on the left one or we fix on the right one. And we always substitute either for the right one or for the left one, depending, they're equally okay. One is called a leftmost derivation, one is called a rightmost derivation. So this so far is a rightmost derivation. All right. Now, just for a moment, let me tell you why we do that. Say I did the left one now. I got 0s1, 0s1, right? That's what we said we would do. Now, let's consider this alternative. I end up in the same place, but here I substituted the right one first and then the left one. Here I substituted the left one first and then the right one. Would you call these two derivations the same or different? Or what difference does it make? So when we talk about grammars, we don't like to think of these two things as different. They're essentially the same. We made the same substitution in each one. We just did it in a different order. One time we did the right first, one time we did the left first. But for the most part, it looks the same. Now, in order to make that more rigorous, if you always take the left one first, then there's never any question. Then these two would never both show up. Only one of them would show up. If you always take the right one first, only one of them would show up. And that makes it more unique. In other words, two derivations are different only if their leftmost derivations are different, or two derivations are different only if their rightmost derivations are different. But if you can get two different derivations where you mixed it up, left and right, that doesn't mean that they're different. Right. We'll talk a little more about that right now. Here's a better way to write derivations as a tree. S goes to SS. The left S goes to... Where? I made a mistake here somewhere? Show me. No. Where? What's your question, Chris? I'm confused because it doesn't seem like you're splitting to get the two S's, really. Where? Here? No. Either either way, I guess. I don't know. Like That seems like one state. No, here S split into two parts. Here's the left S, here's the right S. Here are those two parts again. And now the left one turns into a zero, that's a terminal symbol, an S and a one, and the right one turns into a zero, an S and a one. When you write it as a tree, the question of which one you did first becomes moot. You, you can't see the difference. It looks like a tree. But if I went ahead and started with a different one, like this, well, these two trees look different. <laughs> Okay, So if the trees look different, it's a different derivation. Or equivalently, if the leftmost derivation is different, then it's a different derivation. If they're the same, it's the same derivation. If the trees look identical, it's the same derivation. So, so far, we've only got a unique derivation to find this string. And this is it so far, and we're going to continue. Let's continue here on the left side. Let's use the tree, because this is ugly, and it takes a long time to write it out in the long line. I think the tree's a little broader. It gets it all. So this is the left part. The left part splits into 0, S1. So the S over here should reflect and get that guy. What should we do? Let's keep working on this left side. Now what? We do have an option here. Good, good. Now, for the first time, we have an option to make two different trees. We can either put our two S's on the left side, making this S, the left one, have the two parts, or we can have the left one have a single part and the right S have a double part. 
So Doug's right. For the first time, we have an option. And here's the option. One is that we leave this as a single S and we split this double. Or at that point, I could have made this one double and left that one single. And I could go down from here in both of these, and I will succeed just as well. But when I'm all done, and I get nothing but terminal symbols left, I will have two completely different trees that generate this string. Everyone see that? This is a bad thing. It's bad, bad. It's bad to have to not know which tree to use. When you write a compiler, you don't want to have this choice because you have no idea how to parse this string. You can say yes, that it's a legitimate string, but you don't know which tree to use to generate it. And you're thinking, well, so what? Who, who cares what the tree looks like? It turns out that the tree often gives you a semantic interpretation of the meaning of the string, especially in a programming language. And the next example I'll do will show that. So if you're thinking, I don't get that, I'd like to see that, you will in a minute. Here, it's just the balanced parentheses. There's no difference if you do it this way or this way. But the next example, there'll be a big difference in interpretation of the string if you have one tree that accepts it or a different tree that accepts it. This is called a parse tree. It represents a derivation of a particular string. A leftmost sequence like this is equivalent to a parse tree. A rightmost sequence is equivalent to a parse tree. Two different parse trees for any string in the language means that that language, or the grammar, I should say, not the language, the grammar that generates that language is ambiguous. We say a grammar is ambiguous if any string in the language has two or more parse trees. The grammar is unambiguous only if every single string that's in the language has a unique parse tree or a unique leftmost derivation. That means you can uniquely figure out how to parse it and come up with a single tree that parses it. Let me stop. I just said a lot of important things, so, so let me make sure I can clarify any questions before we move on. Are there any questions about everything so far? Ambiguity, parse trees, derivations, what we're doing here. I'd like to finish this example, and maybe that will spur a couple more questions. But before, any questions to start? Yeah, Todd. considered ambiguous, and one could have introduced to empty symbols sprinkling them throughout. Every S could go to SS, where one is going to That's definitely not, because it doesn't change the way the tree looks. That's right, right. So Todd's question, you know, when you decide to throw the, the empty strings in, that doesn't matter. Unless one S you becomes... Could, you, could, you could split your S into SS and then have the second S become an E just arbitrarily, and that would just add a... Uh, that's true. You could do that. Middle. Right, right. You could have lots of unnecessary S's. But you don't consider that an ambiguous that, grammar. It would still, that would be, would, okay. yes. That would be technically, yes. This grammar is highly ambiguous, yes. Yeah, I mean, if you took S and made SS and SS and SS and then made those all empties, that would make a different tree. Yeah. You could do that with any language. Only this kind of ugly language. <laughs> oh. I'm going to give you languages and I'll give you grammars in a minute that you can't do this with. There are definitely unambiguous grammars that generate the same string. Okay? I just didn't put one down. Oh, and wouldn't it be nice to know if a grammar is ambiguous, right? So, you know what? This is this might be really cool. Instead of us having to actually look at every grammar, you guys go home, maybe it's not so easy, so maybe take a week and write a little program that takes a grammar and then checks whether it's ambiguous or not. Sure. Well, why don't you All right, so that's undecidable. You can't do that. It's impossible. It's a really nice thing to be able to do and we can't do it. It's undecidable to take a grammar and decide is it ambiguous or not. Let's talk about that for a second because it's really important, and then we'll continue with this example. An arbitrary grammar. An arbitrary grammar. I give you an arbitrary grammar. You can certainly read it in and start you know, trying derivation trees. You all know about tree data structures. You try the trees. It's just the depth first you know, uh, search through all these possible trees, and you can try it on every single string. So try it on one string. Try all the derivations. Sooner or later, you're going to see whether you can derive that string in two different ways or not. So the truth is, your program will give the right answer if the answer is, if the answer is that it's ambiguous, it'll eventually find a string with two trees that are different. But if it's unambiguous, your program just doing that simple simulation will run forever. So it cannot tell us yes or no. 
It'll tell us no. It'll tell us ambiguous, that it's not unambiguous, that is. It'll tell us it is ambiguous, <laughs> if it is ambiguous. But it'll never tell us that it's unambiguous if it's unambiguous. It might run forever. So that is not an algorithm. That's simulation. So and if the, the problem yesterday, the matching thing in the talk. <laughs> it's just like the thing in the talk, right. It's just like that undecidable thing that Mike Sipser talked about in the colloquium. All right, let's, that's all right. Yeah. Let's, let's finish this derivation up. Remember, this is the right side, and it's supposed to derive 0, 0, 1, 1. So we don't have too much more to go here. Um, all right, so who wants to do this? Blake, you want to finish the end here? This is the right side. It's supposed to... Excellent. Another 0, S1. And then what happens to this S? Epsilon. Good. So look at the side. 0, 0, epsilon, 1, 1. That's the right side. When you're all done with the derivation tree, all the capital letters become what are called internal nodes, and all the terminal nodes end up on leaves at the end of the tree. Let's do this side. We got three S's, left, middle, right. This one is supposed to be 0, S, 1, and this turns to empty. This one's supposed to be... 0, S, 1, 0, S, 1, empty. And this one is 0, S, 1, empty. There it is. One neat thing that you might notice, what if you actually had this tree and you wanted to print out the string? It's basically the problem of printing out the leaves of a tree in this particular order. What is that order called? It's got a name. It's got a name. You do the left side. It's a binary tree, sir. It's it's yeah. Pre, in, or post. Pre-order, in order, post-order. Left first. Then what? Then right, and then, and then don't do the root. Yeah, so it's, you, you can do pre-order on an n or every tree. Just do all the children first and then the root, recursively. Anyway, I just, it's a side point. It's a connection. This course connects up to everything at some point, to compilers, to architecture, to algorithms. So there's a connection back how you get that string out. doesn't matter. If you forget that, don't worry. There's a tree. All right, enough with this example. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. <laughs> You'll go out to dinner tonight with good company, and who cares about ambiguity? <laughs> That's our second grammar. Third grammar. Third grammar. Here we go. We're still sticking with only one non-terminal, but I will change this soon. This is a famous grammar. That's enough. The plus and the star are terminal symbols. The 0, 1, and 2 are terminal symbols. This generates strings over the alphabet plus star 0, 1, and 2 over a five-symbol alphabet. What kind of strings is it going to generate? Let's do some examples. Let's see this here. Show me the parse tree for this, or a parse tree for this. I'll start at S. Uh, we can't hit this in this three, four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Now we can. It goes up to nine. We'll make it a bigger alphabet. Look. Are you sure? <laughs> Show me how to do this. S plus S. Then what? What about the left now? Goes to three. And the right goes to S times S. And this goes to four. And this goes to five. 
3 plus 4 times 5. This grammar generates arithmetic expressions with integer values 0 through 9 and separated by plus and, and, and multiply symbols. It's part of the grammar in any language that lets you have expressions on the right side of assignment statements. Normally, instead of these being 0, 1, 2 through 9, these would be something called an identifier. You know, that could be a variable or a number. And a variable is something else that could be something. And an identifier is something else that could be something. And that's how the grammar grows and grows. But this is just one little fragment of it. And I made it simple. We just allow single symbols. And there's a reason, because I want to talk again about ambiguity. And I want to talk again about the semantic interpretation of two different parse trees. Here's where you're going to see a difference. So questions so far about the parse tree that we use to generate this string from this grammar. Let's come up with a different parse tree. So we, instead of starting with s plus s, we're going to start with s times s. And now the left side becomes s plus s. And the right side becomes 5. And this becomes 3. And this becomes 4. There's the parse tree. These are completely different. You cannot lay one on top of the other and have them match up. The nodes don't match. Therefore, this grammar is ambiguous on the string. And it's actually, there's a, almost any string, any string actually, it, you can find, find two different parse trees. This is a completely ambiguous grammar. Why does it matter? It's because the compiler has to use these trees not just to say yes or no, but often in the next stage to get some semantic interpretation or meaning to the thing that it just read. So when the compiler reads it this way, it assumes that your expression is 3 plus 4 giving you 7. 7 times 5 gives you 35. And you can write a nice little simple recursive program that evaluates parse trees like this by recursively going down to a node doing the operation in the middle on the two children, and then propagating the values back up. And this one gives you 35. What would this one give you? 23. Well, which one is right? What do we normally mean this? Normally, we mean this one, because there's an automatic precedence of these values. If you write the grammar this way, there is no precedence implied between the values. And because of that, the semantic interpretation of the parsing gets lost. And that's bad. And that's why ambiguity is bad. How do you fix it? There's a lot of ways to fix it, but... Well, Okay, um, well, here's one way to add two different symbols and fix it. I'm going to add two more symbols to my alphabet. So now when you generate strings in this alphabet, you have to generate them with parentheses. Does this fix it or not? Let's see. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So now this is no longer a legitimate string in the language. What is a legitimate string in the language? This is this is both of these strings have parse trees. They have unique parse trees, each one. They're the same though. Aren't they the ones that you did before? Let's look at it. You no longer can put the different Right, the parse trees will be essentially the same. But, but well, let's look at the parse tree for this one, Chris. So this one, what's the first one we're going to do? This one. S times S, because that's the outer one, right? So S times S. But wait, there's more. There's open paren, close paren. Now what about this S? It becomes open paren, S. Plus S, S close paren, and this becomes five. and this becomes three, and this becomes four. 
Right? So this is the parse tree for this one. There is no other parse tree for this one. There's no other way we can do it. We've gotten the ambiguity out of the grammar by forcing the person who's writing their program to choose either this or this. That's one way to do it. There's other ways. But I just want you to see that you can have many different grammars that generate essentially the same thing, that one is ambiguous, one's not ambiguous. Okay. Questions about this? New example. Example four. Now we'll focus not so much on the definitions and ambiguity and on derivations, but let's focus more on, uh, on how to build these grammars. If I give you a problem, if I say, here's a language, build a grammar. It's harder than doing finite state machines. Grammars tend to challenge people more than writing machines challenge people. Machines are a process. Most people can kind of program them and figure out what to do next because it's iterative. But grammars are very elusive in, in trying to pin them down. One style is to use a recursive idea and to define the grammar inductively based on a recursive idea. That's one style. Another style is like you do with machines. Have each non-terminal have a semantic meaning and keep that semantic meaning consistent. So I'll write that st uh, strategy number two, semantic meaning for the non-terminal. But I got to add that this is an art and it's not so easy to just come up with grammars. Let's do two examples. We're going to do equal zeros and ones. That means the zeros don't have to come before the ones. They can be mixed up as long as there's an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones. It's definitely not a regular set. Let's come up and make a context-free grammar for it. This is going to be an example of the semantic meaning style. S is supposed to generate anything that has an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones and everything that has an equal number of zeros and an equal number of ones. So we have to make sure that everything like this can be generated by this grammar and nothing that's not like this is generated by the grammar. Got to make sure both ends. Sometimes you can include everything you want, but you would inadvertently include things you don't want. Be careful. Sometimes it's good to include things you don't want and then try to chop them off. Sometimes you got to get it all done at the beginning. So here's how we'll do it. We got two choices. We either start with a zero or we start with a one. If we start with a zero, we'll go to another semantic state called A. And if we start with a one, we'll go to another state called B. And here's the semantic interpretation of A. Well, you tell me, what should A generate? Describe the strings that A should generate if I started with a zero. Things that have one extra one in them, that have one more one than zero. Anything that has one more one than zero. B should generate strings, any string that has one more zero than one. Will it be easy to describe that? Will I eventually loop back and be able to describe this in terms of the non-terminals I have? I hope so, because I don't want to keep making this grammar. I don't want to make an infinite number of non-terminals. That's not a grammar anymore. So hopefully, when you do the semantic approach, you wrap around and you define your non-terminals in terms of ones you've already seen. You'll see this immediately. Uh, need a yeah, I guess what else can S go to? Empty. Empty. Right. Now let's go to A. A has two choices. You start with zero, you start with one. If you get a one, what do you continue with? Any string that has an equal number of zeros and ones. A, I like to think of A as I owe you a one. Okay, if you want to give it a meaning, O U a one. B is I owe you a zero. And S is I don't owe you squat. We're even. So if A pays you back the one, that it doesn't owe you a one anymore, you're even. What if A starts out with another zero? Then what happens? Then you're two ones in the hole. Give me one string that has an extra one and then another string that's got an extra one. That'll give me any strings that have two extra ones. What about B now? Let's finish up this whole grammar. 0S and 1BB. 
This is one way to write a grammar. Think of the semantic meaning of the non-terminals and wrap them around and define them in terms of each other. I'm not going to do the example because it's boring, but glance at this. Do you think this is ambiguous or not? What's your gut instinct? Anybody have a gut instinct about this? Is it an ambiguous grammar or a non-ambiguous grammar? Probably ambiguous. Think it's unambiguous. Who else has it? You probably ambiguous. Does anybody else think it's ambiguous or unambiguous? Anybody have an opinion? If you think it is ambiguous, where is the ambiguity if it's anywhere? I mean, look, there's no ambiguity here, right? If it starts with a zero, you use this production. If it starts with a one, you use this production. If you're in A and you continue with a one, you use this production. If you continue with a zero, you use this production. So where's the ambiguity? I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm, 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 right. What if there's two A's there, right? If I need a string that has, in the end, two ones that are extra, I can do that in a lot of different ways with two concatenated strings, each of which has one extra. I can have lots of different strings with one extra one and lots of different strings with another extra one that all together make me a string that have two extra ones. And this double A represents that choice. There's a lot of different ways I can split the string up and get those two things. So, so it is ambiguous, and you can try to find an example yourself, and maybe I even put it on the homework, I don't remember. We won't do it now together, but it is an ambiguous grammar. That's the right instinct. I gotta warn you that it's really easy to have the wrong instinct with grammars. They're very, very complex. They're harder to understand than machines, I think. All right. The recursive way, I don't really want to do a new example for it, but, but I'll do maybe just a quick one. We did a couple recursive ways. The first two examples we did were recursive. Zero to the n, one to the n. Just to remind you. Zero to the n, one to the n is another zero to the n, one to the n recursively with a zero, one around it. That's the recursive idea, to wrap around. Here's another recursive example. I want you to guess what this one is. And then I'll talk about this for just a minute, and then we'll move on. Look at this grammar for a minute. While I erase my other board. Uh, so we have one hypothesis that it's that balance parentheses again. No, but no, that balance parentheses, the same number of zeros and ones. Oh, just equal number of zeros and ones without balance. So the same as that grammar. That's certainly true, but I think but there's more to it. Yeah. Okay, so, so we agree that this includes, that everything in here has an equal number of zeros and ones. How do you prove stuff like that? You prove it by induction. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do it. <laughs> A grammar is scream for inductive proofs because they're often recursive. But, but just intuitively, S generates S with a bunch of ABs. There's no zeros and ones there, so nothing happens yet. If you do this over and over again, what do you get? S goes to SAB. You get lots and lots of ABs. Sooner or later, the S disappears. So what about AB? AB generates more S's, but every time it generates more S's, it generates an equal number of zeros and ones. There's no way to do any production here that, don't ge that doesn't generate an equal number of zeros and ones. So I agree, everything this generates will have an equal number of zeros and ones. But does it generate all the different strings that have an equal number of zeros and ones? If I give you any string at all that has an equal number of zeros and ones, how about this string? Can it generate this string? It's always going to be balanced with the... It's going to be symmetric. Uh, because you can only generate S can only turn into A and then a B, but never B and then an A. Mm -hmm. And so, but A could disappear. Oh, that's true. So I could make as many A's as I want disappear, and then I can have as many B's in the front. So Doug made a good objection, whose answer actually shows exactly what you were thinking is a problem. Really, isn't a problem. You can actually have as many one S zeros showing up as you want. 
So can we do this? How would you how would you generate the string from this grammar if we can? Yeah, tell me how. S goes to well, it goes to S A B. Uh, the first S goes to empty. Uh, the A goes to we need a zero and one on the uh, zero one S one. Mm -hmm. You can send the B to empty. I mean, there are a million ways you could do this, but so then the S. All right, wait. There are a million ways you can do this. So what does that tell you about the grammar? It's very ambiguous. It's an incredibly ambiguous grammar. But let's continue. So from here. And that S goes to an SAB. Um, oh, no, yeah, I guess you're right. You can go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There's a million ways to do it. Yeah, you can go to zero. If you sat down and tried it, you could all do it. It, it. It's not that hard to do. Almost anything you try works, actually. It's one of those good problems. You think for a long time, and then anything you try makes it work anyhow. Let me tell you a little bit of the history of this grammar. It is the same as this. Somebody gives you two grammars, it would be nice to know if they're the same, wouldn't it? Undecidable. Undecidable, undecidable. You can't decide anything about grammars that you really want to know. The only thing you can decide about a grammar is if it accepts absolutely nothing. You can decide that. <laughs> You're laughing. If I give you a Turing machine, you can't decide if that accepts exactly nothing. That you can't do. But at least with a grammar, you can at least do that. You can at least check if it doesn't do anything. You can check if the start symbol never generates any terminal. But you can't even do something as simple as whether the start symbol accepts all the strings. That's too hard. Finding state machines, we know everything about. Context-free grammars, boom, we're in never, never land here. Violate zone, whatever. Some bad place. Never, never yeah, that's what I thought. I, got, I, got, I switched it. I hated Peter Pan when I was, it scared me. <laughs> That's this person coming to the parents' leave and takes you out of the window. It's like, yikes! <laughs> I don't want to fly. I want my parents to come home. <laughs> <laughs> Scary show. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, uh, let's get back to this. <laughs> There's something special about this grammar. This grammar has only one production out of each non-terminal that actually has anything interesting in it. See this grammar? You got two productions that have non-terminals in them. Two productions, two productions. Most grammars, there's some non-terminal somewhere that has a choice. Here, there's actually no choice. If you, just, if you have an A and you want to continue, all your whole choice is whether it'll make it disappear or continue. Wouldn't you think that these grammars are easier to understand than regular grammars? These grammars, where every single unique non-terminal has only one production that has non-terminals in it, or the, all the rest of the production are terminal symbols. So this was my big mistake 20 years ago. I thought these grammars were very, very easy to understand. I thought they would all be unambiguous. I thought they would all be deterministic. I thought they would all be simple, simple, simple. And it was just trivial, because any time you had a choice, there was no choice to make. But it turned out that just the choice of whether to continue or the choice of making it disappear is enough complexity to make every single question about these kind of grammars undecidable and to make them very, very hard. There's a few things that are easier about these grammars than regular grammars, but not many things. That's what that paper is all about. It's about grammars that look like this. So where did this grammar come from? I wanted to show that there were some languages that you couldn't do with these kind of grammars. They were too restricted. So you can certainly do 0 to the n, 1 to the n with this kind of grammar. It's just the same grammar we used before. S goes to 0, S1. And then I thought, well, equal zeros and 1s. How are you going to do that? Because it seems like you really need to have these two possibilities. This was the way I always did equal zeros and 1s. And I sat for three weeks to try to figure out a grammar that did equal zeros and 1s that only had one non-terminal production, something that looked like this. Three weeks and I didn't figure this out. It's a long time. It wasn't just three weeks during lunch. It was three weeks all day long. That's how dense I was. And I told my advisor this problem that I was working on. And I called him up. And I go, hey, what do you think? I go, do you think there's a grammar that does equal zeros and ones? And here's his response. He goes, how long have you worked on it? And I go, three weeks. And he goes, well, I think if there was one, then you would have found it already in three weeks. <laughs> so of course, two weeks later, I do find it. Just goes to show you, his confidence in me was really well founded. Uh, <laughs> he would have found it in three weeks, maybe. But anyway, my student and I took another two weeks, and we finally found this. And 
This is nothing. This is like a teeny blurb, a, a paragraph in the paper. It took us a month just to get over this. But it was useful because once we got this, we realized there were tons of other languages that we thought we couldn't get with this restricted kind of grammar that we really could get. So it kind of broke through this barrier of our wrong intuition about these grammars being simple and we were able to kind of move forward. So I just wanted to put this up as a good example of a recursive gra grammar. How do you interpret this? S can have any strings A's and B's. A and B are also strings of equal zeros and ones. But A is the ones where you have a zero in front and a one at the end. And B is the one where you have a one in front and a zero at the end. And in the middle, you can have anything you want. So if you think about this recursively, you can convince yourself that you can actually get all the equal zeros and ones. But as simple as that is, like I said, three weeks just to find the stupid grammar, and, and they can be elusive. And I'm, did you I'm, them early, but not realize it didn't? No, 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 I just didn't think of it. Do you need the Tried everything, it didn't. Pathetic. Why can't you do it in just one line? Why can't you do S goes to 0, S1, or 1, S0, 1? You can, but that's not the special kind of grammars that we're dealing with. You can do that. That's perfectly fine. That's another grammar that generates the same thing. That's true. That will give you equal zeros and ones. But here we have two productions on the right that have non-terminals in them. And that's more powerful than the restricted kind of grammars that we were trying to look at. Oh, you're, you're saying you, you start talking about, okay. Right, right. No, language. you're right, Michael. If you just want to use context-free languages, there's another one that does the same thing. You, absolutely. Actually, here I think you might need an SS, but I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure if you do or not. You have to... You've got to be able to duplicate as many as you want. So maybe you need that too, right. but maybe not. Okay. Right. I, 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 I want to be careful before I say anything. I'm, I, I'm not sure that what Michael first suggested works, but it may. But this certainly works if we add this in. So did you find that there are any languages that can't be described without the power of Yes, there are some. In fact, we invented, there's a pumping lemma for context-free languages, which is somewhat similar to the pumping lemma for finite state machines, which show things that can't be context-free. Here's an example of a language that's not context-free. Kind of triple counting is not context-free. You can't do this with any context-free language. Okay? So we invented what we called an intercalation lemma. It wasn't really a pumping lemma, but it gave you a way to show that some languages were not generatable by these special kind of grammars. So if you had a candidate language, you could try our little lemma and see if it would show you that it wasn't possible. And there were lots of them that are impossible. And they have certain kind of features. So just to make but, but it's completely off topic. I mean, it's a good <laughs> question, but it's just, it's way off on a tangent. Right? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's sitting there. It's, I don't know, the paper's oh, 15, 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this one here is context-free, whereas the ones on the right are not? Is that, uh, no, they're all, these are all context-free. Okay. Th this, is, this is what we call the single tree grammar. Okay. If you think about what the trees look, what do the parse trees look like for these grammars? <coughs> There's only one tree you could possibly have. It's just a question of which things disappear. Mm -hmm. It's a question of where you prune the tree. Okay. Here, you can have really different looking trees. Here, when you get ambiguity, you get ambiguity because the same huge tree just gets pruned in different places. So we call these single tree grammars. Okay. So single tree grammars are pretty well understood now. I know at least of one person who wrote a paper on some open question that we left because whenever that happens, the journal editor sends the author of the first paper, the paper to referee. So I have to go read that paper and figure out what they were talking about. Um, and I have to remember the open question that I raised because it was 15 years before and I had forgotten it. But, but at least a couple people have finished up the loose details that we left off. But we more or less, we more or less characterized these and we were done with it. All right. Um, one more example, then we'll quit today. <laughs> okay.
Chris Walker asked a question a minute ago about languages that you know couldn't be accepted by these grammars. This is a language that can't be accepted by any context-free grammar. It can't be generated by any context-free grammar. You can try all you want. You can go home, work all night. You'll never get a grammar that generates that. In the third or fourth day of this five-day sequence, I'll show you a pumping lemma to, to help you prove things like that. But right now, you just have to take my word for it that there's no way, and that if you try, you'll get stuck. What I do want to show you is that if I allow the grammar to be more powerful, if I take away the restriction of context-free, and I allow it to be context-sensitive, that I really can accept things like this. And I want you to see that context-sensitive grammars look very much like machines. They're very powerful. If you can think of a machine computation, you can pretty much simulate it directly with a grammar. And this connection doesn't work quite as well for context-free grammars, but it's an important connection to have. It will eventually give us the connection between computation and grammars. We had it with finite state machines and linear grammars. We're going to have it again now as an example. And the relationship between context-free grammars and machines is complicated. So this is kind of a good warm-up for it. OK. Now, this grammar is long, but it's not complicated. It's just long. We're going to finish this example, and I need to motivate it first. Here's how we're going to generate these kind of strings. Think of an amusement park. Those amusement parks where you know, the guys try to sucker you in to put five bucks down on some game that you can't possibly win. And uh, one of the games they have is you know, some shooting game or some throwing game where some things move along this way. And then they turn around and they move along this way, like those shooting ducks. It's a long analogy that I probably don't really need. But the, the, this grammar that I'm doing, imagine that it's going to move left and right like a shooting duck. Ding, ding, ding. And as it goes left and right, it's going to do all the important things. Does that help? I don't know. <laughs> Al and R are the left and right ends of the shooting gallery. D is the duck that's going back and forth. A, B, and C are non-terminals that will eventually respectively turn into 0s, 1s, and zeros. A's will be the zeros on the left, B's will be the ones in the middle, C's will be the zeros on the right. Is that the position of the duck? Yeah, the duck's here. The duck's at the left end. Okay, and is A, B, C other positions of the duck? Or? No, well, A, B, and C are like are like, uh, the duck's going to go by them, and when it goes by them, it's going to turn them into, it's going to double them. As, here, let me explain. It's a good question. Here, here's what's going to happen. The duck's going to go from the left to the right. As the duck goes and it sees an A, it doubles the A. It puts an A. I see an A, I'm leaving two A's behind me. I see a B, keep going. I'm leaving two B's behind me. I see a C, I leave two C's behind me. I see the right end. Doo -doo. I see a C. Well, maybe at this point it'll just go right back to the beginning. Let's make it nice and easy. Because right back doesn't do anything. Now, again, sees an A, double the A. It sees another A. Not yet, right? It wants to add one A at a time, one B at a time, one C at a time. So the first A it sees, it doubles. And then it just passes through the rest of the A. You'll see it. But I want to give you a sense of the difference between context-free and context-sensitive. The idea of moving the duck forward and thinking of this as a computation looks a little bit like this. It's a good example. Uh, LDA. What should LDA turn into? L A A D. Does everyone see how this really represents a movement or a piece of computation as if I was reading a tape? I'm in a certain state. I see an A. I move the D to the other side, and I leave an extra A behind me. It's like a Turing machine almost. You have a tape. You don't know what a Turing machine is, but it's like a program. You have a tape. You see the A on the tape. You move the D around it, and you write an extra A on the tape. 
Don't like the tape analogy? Forget that analogy. LDA turns into LAAD. The duck moves ahead two spaces, doubles the A in back of it. This is not a single symbol. This is not context-free. It's context-sensitive. I cannot just substitute LAAD for a single A. It's only in the presence of the LD in front of it that I substitute it. It's context-sensitive. Some A's can get substituted like this, and some can't. See the difference between context-free and context-sensitive? Context-free is like somebody handcuffing you. Tell me what substitution you want to use, but you've got to use it everywhere. It doesn't give you control over the computation. Context-sensitive gives you much more control. You can write grammars that look like machines. Let's write a little more of this. I'll go for that. What does that correspond to? Chris gave me the idea. I know he knows what it corresponds to. Somebody else, tell me what this means. This means if the duck is... Good. If the duck's traveling through the A's, what does it do? Just passes through. Everybody see that? This is just like a machine. If the duck sees this symbol, write that symbol behind it and move the machine to the right. When you talk about Turing machines, you're going to see it's just like a Turing machine. All right, well, that's fine for the beginning. Let, let, let's, let's put these production in the order that things are going to happen, and we'll fill them all in as we go. Uh, ADB, yeah. The L just sticks there, right. The L just stays there. L ADB goes to what? Go ahead. Good. So when you finally hit the B, did I get it right? Yeah. When you finally hit the B in the presence of an A in back of you, then you move the D over and you double the B. And when you're in the middle of the Bs, BDB, what do you do? Just pass it over. We need one more like this. Uh, I, um, I could do it, and there's many other different things I could do also. And, and, and it might even be simpler or faster. This is just one way, and it's, it's just meant to show you the computation field. But there's certainly other choices. You're 100% right, Chris. So it's not the only are way. Are the, the ones as we're passing through the series of A's or the series of B's or the series of C's, are those really necessary? You mean could we just back up then and do other things? I, I don't know if it's necessary or not, but it certainly works. Th th this method is definitely going to generate things 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. I think it's easy to describe. And if you, the first thing you think of is, can I make this grammar a little faster or more efficient? Then you're thinking like a programmer, and it's fine. And maybe is the answer, but whether we can or not isn't so important. We just want to make sure we get it to actually generate this, because this is something that's not a context-free grammar. All right, so now we've got everything fine as far as moving the D left to right. What's going to happen next? C, C, it's going to hit what? Go right, so what, what's it going to hit? The D is going to hit the R, right? So here's what I do. If you ever get DR, I, I don't actually need the C in front of it, but I guess I could put it there. But if D hits the R, if D appears with an R on its right, what do I do? How do I send it back? ER. I paint the duck E, and the duck turns around. Remember, this side of the duck's D, and when the duck turns around, there's an E on this side. You just remember that the duck turns around, and you use a different non-terminal to remember that. D goes left. If you want the duck to turn around, you call it E, and you make a bunch of productions with E that go right. What do you want E to do? Pass by. Just pass by everything. So here's the E commands. C E is E C. B E is E B. A E is E A. And finally, it's going to hit the left end. L E. L D. L D. Right. Turn the duck around. 
See, the duck thing isn't so bad here, right? Doesn't it help a little? I like the duck thing. I know it always helps me think of this. Uh, uh, when does the madness end? Whenever you want. A is zero, B is one, C is zero. But how do we get rid of the R's and the L's? They have to disappear. So R at any point can turn to empty. And LD, when D, only when D comes back to the beginning can you shut the machine off and make all the lights go off and only show the A's, B's, and C's. And is this what if you use these early, then you don't end up being able to generate anything. Then your machine gets stuck. Then your grammar doesn't generate anything. We also need an empty somewhere. We can't generate an empty string with this. Oh. Uh, S needs to be that or empty. Yeah, well, we don't need it because I'll just make this one. <laughs> I, I, I know this doesn't do the empty string. But, you know, look, it's not so hard. Watch. Yeah, I mean, grammars are so easy to do union. Are context-free grammars closed under union? Here's one grammar, blah, blah, blah. Here's another grammar, blah, blah, blah. 400 productions, 800 productions. Here's another grammar. This generates everything this one does, union with everything that one does. Context-free grammars are definitely closed under union. It's the easiest thing you can do with grammar. You have one context-free grammar, you got another one, you can union them together. And there's a last point, and then I'll answer questions. This definitely accepts 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 0 to the n. This helps you appreciate the connection between grammars and computation. Watch this. Here's a context-free grammar. Zero to the n, 1 to the n, followed by any number of zeros you want. Can anybody write a grammar for this? See this? Here's the 0 to the n, 1 to the n part. Here's the 0 star part. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So what does this tell you about context-free languages closed under concatenation, yes or no? They are. You just take the two start symbols and connect them one to another. Chris, you have a question? Um, I, I'm concerned about this in that it seems that I can see how you could verify any string can be generated by this, mm -hmm. but if you're just daily generating strings with this machine and you decided somewhere in the middle to turn a B to a 1, it would make the grammar crash. And is, is that... To show that a given grammar generates a given language, mm -hmm. you have to show that there exists a parse tree right. for every string in that language, and that you agree there exists. Right. Okay, you also have to show that there isn't any other string that's not in the language that there's a parse tree for. And I think that's pretty clear, too. There's no way to get a string that isn't of this form. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's a lot of trees that will eventually get you to the point that you can't do anything, that doesn't matter. Okay. And as far as the Turing machine goes, you just think of those as bad computations, and we don't care about them. So, so it, you're right to perceive it, but it's not a problem. Uh, I'll do more questions, I promise. I just want to just finish this one idea. Uh, Who can give me a grammar that does this one? A little different. Tony, can you do this? Can you give me a grammar that generates any number of zeros followed by same ones as zeros? Let's do it together. Split it into two parts. Make a non-terminal for this part and a non-terminal for this part. So let's call this part uh, a. a, and this part B. Is fine. B. Fine. So what's A? How do we write a grammar for A for just all zeros? It's zero. And then you go back and you do A again. And then you end it off with what? How do you make that A disappear sooner or later? You get zero, 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 zero. Right, and epsilon's good. 
Excellent. And now what about the B part? The B part's got to be 1 to the M, 0 to the M. Right, so it's a similar... Oh, 1 to the M, 0 to the M. Right. Yeah, so you're going to have two other symbols like uh, C and D, I guess. Uh, oh, oh, I see. I think we, we could do that, but we don't need to do anything so complicated. Um, we can just do this like we did the 0 to the n, 1 to the n at the beginning of the day, where you have a 1 at the beginning and a 0 at the end, and everything in the middle is the same kind of thing. Cool. Okay, and then... So again, it, here's one grammar that does all the zeros. Here's another grammar that does 1 to the n, 0 to the n. And now we concatenate them together to get a grammar that does things that start with one and ends with the other. So concatenations close, and that works out. Why am I doing this big example, this one and this one? What's the intersection between these two sets? This is a context-free language. We came up with a grammar for it. This is a context-free language. We came up with a grammar for it. What's their intersection? What do these two sets have in common? The, no, they do have things in common. They have, these have things where these sets are equal, and this can be any number. This has sets where these two are equal, and this can be any number. So what do they have in common? Do you know, Teresa? Does it have n equal to q? Yeah. I'll call it m. I'll call it triple m. <laughs> but it's things, well, not can't call it that. <laughs> oh, jeez. Now I call it that. Right, it means that these two have to be the same from this side. The second two have to be the same from that side. So all three have to be the same are the only things that are in common with all of these. Is this context-free? No, that's what this language was supposed to... Well, you took my word for it. It's not context-free. We needed a context-sensitive grammar to do it. But it's also the intersection of two context-free languages. So are context-free languages closed under intersection? No. So are they closed under complement? No, because they're closed under union for sure. If they were closed under union and complement, then they'd be closed under intersection. So context-free grammars are closed under concatenation, closed under union, not closed under complement, not closed under intersection. It doesn't mean that if you take the complement of a context-free language that it's definitely not context-free. It might be. It might not be. Hey, I wonder if you just give me a grammar and you ask me if its complement is context-free, if I could figure that out. <laughs> no. You can't figure that out. Is the complement of a grammar context-free or not? You can't figure it out. Some are. The complement of 0 to the n, 1 to the n is context-free. The complement of palindromes is context-free. Palindromes are context-free. Strings that are the same. The first part is the second part. Strings that look like this, not context-free. Can't make a context-free language for this. The complement of this, strings that are not the first part the same as the second part, yes, context-free. There's some really interesting results, and we'll get into them later when we talk about machines. But this pretty much gives you the whole grammar part of this next level. So we're going to finish this up next time. We need to talk about special forms of this grammar, Chomsky normal form. That'll help us with three specific things that come up later. It's hard to take an arbitrary context-free grammar and work with it. It's nicer to make it in a particular form. We'll learn how to take any one of these context-free grammars, make it in a particular form, and that'll help us do three or four more things that'll help us move over to the machines and continue exploring this, this next level.